Hello students, welcome to another lecture video for ComSci 125 Operating Systems. So welcome to chapter 4 which is the process instruction. In the previous chapter we talked about some introductory concepts in the, uh, the, the ideas about operating systems. We learned that the operating system is responsible for sharing the CPU, sharing the memory, and providing access to devices. And we also, I also demonstrated some examples of virtualization of the CPU, the virtualization of the memory, some issues when it comes to concurrency, and the idea of persistence. Now let's proceed to this process abstraction. Okay. What is this all about? Now one of the responsibilities of an operating system is to provide a convenient environment for users to run programs. And uh, we also talked last time about the role of the operating system that given the physical resource, it creates a virtual resource so that it can provide an illusion of uh, having an unlimited or more uh, virtual CPUs than the actual physical CPUs. And that is the concept of CPU virtualization. So using this concept, the OS can promote the illusion that many virtual CPUs exist. But in reality, we only have, let's say, a single CPU. How does the operating system does this? By uh, juggling programs. As you can see in the image here, okay, so we have the juggler here. We can think of the hands of the juggler as the CPU, the physical CPUs, and we have several programs that would like to run, for example, these balls. So how can these balls or these programs run three programs when we only have two CPUs or two hands? So the way to do this is by juggling these balls like this. So uh, by switching, rapidly switching okay, one ball to an, uh, one ball to another. So this is the basic idea of providing the illusion of any CPUs. And uh, the technical term for that is called time sharing. And the idea is you have uh, you run one process, then stop that process after some time, and then run another process. And because of this time sharing scheme, it's possible to have some performance degradation. So in the case of the juggler here on the right, uh, he has to be quick and he has to be skilled to be able to juggle these three balls and that somehow limits the performance so for example if we only have two balls here then the juggler has no need to juggle so the performance is very high and how is this uh, moving or running from one process to another accomplished this is done by a mechanism called context switching which we will discuss in detail in the next chapter so it's very important in the study of operating systems the definitions or the concept of mechanisms and policies as shown here to be able to perform uh, or to be able to run several programs here but via CPU virtualization, we have to introduce a mechanism called context switch. Now, what do we mean by mechanism? Uh, mechanism is a low, these are low level methods or protocols that implement a functionality. 
basically answers the question how an example of that is context switch so how do we provide an illusion of running multiple tasks given a limited number of CPU how can that be accomplished via the mechanism of context switch now the partner of mechanism is policy policy are algorithms for making some kinds of decision within the OS and it answers the question which an example would be the scheduling policy deciding which program to run first and then next going back to the our example here the juggler the policy would be determining which ball to catch and which ball to release which color so that's part of the policy the mechanism here is juggling the juggling mechanism I want to be able to uh, play around with three balls but I only have two hands how do I do that the mechanism is by juggling that's the context switching and the policy would be which ball shall I catch and which ball shall I release so that's basically the analogy of uh, mechanism and policy now let's talk about the entity that is also very or the concept is also very essential in OS then this concept is are called processes okay. so a process is uh, is a running program okay. what do we mean by that by uh, this video lecture is being recorded in OBS and OBS while well, it's doing the recording is actually a process okay, while doing the recording I have to double click the OBS icon to be able to start the OBS process okay. so at this point uh, I would like to differentiate the concept of a program and a process a program itself is lifeless it just sits on the disks as a bunch of instructions and some data and usually it's called a program image looking back in our examples okay, so we have here several elf files so these elf files are the programs they are just uh, sitting here in my file system And they occupy some disk space okay, and they have some of these properties they are not yet processes they are programs they are lifeless collection of uh, uh, bytes bits and bytes so if you can you can actually look at the contents of the hex dump of uh, cpu.elf and you see that it's just a binary a binary file it's not doing anything so that's a program so it just resides on the disk we can uh, how do we then turn a program into a process so you can think of the program as a lifeless body and then when you breathe in or you, you put a soul to the this life this body then that becomes a living entity so that's essentially what happens so uh, the operating system will give life to this lifeless program and come up with a process and how do we character characterize this process we do this by looking at the the different data structures and system resources uh, that it uses or accesses so the idea here is the process is now a living quote-unquote living entity and uh, it's breathing it's alive 
breathing quote and cons alive. But how do we view it? Uh, do we still view it as a just a collection of uh, bits and bytes, or are there other information that you can uh, use to characterize the process? So the question that arises is, what comprises a process? Well, the idea is that you can actually look at the process by looking at the machine state. Okay. So the process is uh, in the main memory. Okay. So the machine state, one, one component of the machine state is the memory, which actually the address space of the process. This is the range of addresses that a process can access. And it contains uh, instructions or code, the assembly code or the object code, or some static data that is part of the program when it was created. So that's one memory. Another uh, component of the machine state are the registers. So recall in the previous chapter, wherein the first discussion was about the von Neumann architecture. Okay, so uh, in addition to memory, we have registers also, which are high-speed uh, storage for small data items. And in the case of the x86 architecture, which you studied in Comsei 131, examples of general purpose registers are EAX, EVX, RAX, RVX. So this here is for uh, 32 bits. Now, in addition to these general purpose registers, a process will also be storing information in special purpose registers, like the program counter. For example, in the x86, we have RIP. Uh, this one contains the address of the next instruction to be executed. Then the stop pointer, which contains uh, a pointer to the top of the stack. We'll, we'll discuss the stack later, what is purpose. And also the frame pointer or the base pointer or RBP, which is used to mark the different uh, stack frames during a function call. Okay. And then lastly, uh, we can the, the machine state is composed is also composed of IO information like the list of open files for a particular process. Okay, so in summary, these three things constitute a process, and uh, we'll have an example on on this on how to view this information later. Okay, so let's take a look at this example as an example of these characteristics. Okay. Now, uh, we're going to use the CPU.elf example, okay? So, one thing to remember also that a process has a process identifier or PID, okay? And we use that PID to obtain the information about that particular process. So, first, let's execute or let's run our CPU elf CPU elf program so it requires a parameter so let's say so it outputs uh, so let, let, let me repeat the process in case you miss it So this uh, example now, we have a program that is running. Now we would like to, so this is now a process, okay? Uh, remember that by this is our program. Once we execute this using this 
command from the shell we now have a process now we would like to get some information about this process so we can use the ps command and then uh, these parameters and then look for cpu.plf okay, so we'll have this information and uh, of interest to us is uh, which process I think um, so let's not use the command okay so you have this uh, process ID so this will be the process ID number the ID and using this uh, this uh, PID we can obtain information about the characteristics of the process that uh, the, the, this, this is run uh, that is currently running so as mentioned we can look at the machine state like the memory the registers and some IO information now let's take a look at the memory so in Linux for example most uh, information uh, about a process are stored in the proc file system let me enlarge this so the upper window we have the pro our program is still running then we can actually look at six process id 6132 and then status to get information about the process okay so like this one so we can obtain the name of the process some umask and we see here some memory information vm okay. vm is virtual memory so this basically describes the amount of uh, memory allocated to this process okay. so you have here some additional information Okay, so that's the uh, general information about this particular process. So this is a good uh, way to learn about uh, this particular process. Now, regarding the registers, um, we can't see it here because the update of this is very uh, very dynamic but uh, we can actually attach a, a debugger so that we can examine the execution of this uh, uh, program right? but we'll discuss that later right but you've used the debugger before in Comsai 131 so when you run a program you see the contents of the registers as the debugger executes the program so in that mechanism the debugger also actually creates a process okay, when you're debugging a program so that's one and the next the next item that might be interested to us is the IO information so IO information uh, this refers to let's say the files right whenever you write something uh, on the screen you're actually writing to a, a file so the screen is mapped to a file the keyboard is mapped to a file uh, and other things right now in Linux we have what you call uh, standard uh, uh, devices that are automatically created for a particular process so going back to this uh, example you can actually look at the FD okay, FD is file descriptor so if you look at this particular directory under this process we have 
zero one two. So this these are the open pre-open file descriptors for the for this particular process. So let's say uh, zero is for the standard input. That's for the keyboard. One is for the error uh, standard output, and two is for the standard error. Uh, let's try writing to the standard output of this particular process. The expected behavior should be that, let's say, So what we're doing here is we, we are writing to the standard output of this currently running process. So if I do this, so you will notice that I was able to write to the standard output to the screen when uh, using this command by accessing this file descriptor. Okay, so this is not part of the original program, but I was able to write on the screen on the standard output of this currently running process. Okay, so in summary, these are just the illustration of this information. Like, uh, if you want to, look at the We have the we actually attached to the running process. Uh, let's say IR. So IR will allow us to view the information about the registers. So let's say let's look at the instruction pointer or IP. Okay. So we have currently in the we are currently in the get time of the instruction and if we count so we should continue the execution of the program okay and then we interrupt and then let's examine the uh, register RIP so this is what happens so as you can see here we have a running process at the top screen we attach a debugger and we can see the values of the registers changing okay. so this way we have uh, actually a running process okay so we we'll detached from this particular process but the process is still running okay, as shown here okay so i hope that demonstration has given you an idea of this machine state that describes a running process Okay, so given that we now understand the concept of a process, the machine state that characterizes a process, now let's look at the API or the application programming interface that are related to processes. So an operating system should provide some API or syscalls that will allow you or they allow a user to manipulate processes and uh, these uh, categories of APIs are typically functions for creating a process, destroying a process, waiting for a process to finish, uh, miscellaneous control and status. 
So the create uh, API will create a new process to run a program. Okay. So usually this happens when you double click an icon in a graphical environment or when you type the name of the executable on the command prompt and, and press enter command prompt or the shell so if we have a command line interface uh, it's important to know that when a user accesses the operating system he can access it either by using a graphical user interface or a command line enter interface now I'm sure all of you are very comfortable with using the graphical user interface but in ComSci 1 to 5 I would like you to learn we would like you to learn or to be uh, confident in using the command line interface or the terminal so going back so we have functions for creating processes in an operating system uh, although we'll discuss this later in the next chapter but in the case of Linux we have fork, exec and clone for destroying processes we have or yeah hunting processes we have the kill uh, system call for waiting for a process to finish we have the wait and for miscellane miscellaneous control we have uh, kill for example you can terminate a process or when temporarily or suspend the process and then resume its execution execution at a later point i'll demonstrate this later but for now we have this category of uh, process api or functions and then we have status to get uh, to get some information about the status of a process which actually i demonstrated earlier so we'll have a detailed discussion of this the actual operations of this in the next chapter now let's take a look at somehow detailed view of, of process creation okay so again this is the primary mechanism when a program comes alive so this is called process creation and this is uh, these are actually implemented in uh, in these functions which we'll discuss later so the general process of process creation is the first one is to load the is to load the program code load the program code and the static data into the memory into the address space of the process remember that we have the memory and we have the address space and the program is from the disk right? when a process is created the program image is loaded to the address space of the newly created process right? programs initially reside on disk in executable format like elf so that's why in my examples the extension name i place the dot elf to indicate that it is an executable file although it's not actually important but for consistency I, I use that ELF for Windows we have the PE format so these are that exe that exe so those are if you see a file with that extension you know that that is an executable file or a program so this process of loading the contents of the program to the address space of the newly created process can be performed what, what we call lazy lazy loading when we say lazy loading you don't load everything in one shot you only load to the memory the pieces that will be needed in the next few execution cycles Okay. so loading programs of code or data only as they are needed during program execution because some programs are actually big but in my experience or by empirical analysis not all of those programs or co code will necessarily be executed in the next execution cycle so you only load code when needed so that's called lazy loading so that actually improves performance and at the same time uh, we have a more efficient use of the 
main memory because uh, not everything will no no process will have the main memory. So it's allow sharing of memory. So after loading the program code, the next is to create the runtime stack. Right? So when a program when a process is created, the OS should allocate a stack for that particular process. What is the purpose of the stack? The, uh, we use the stack for storing uh, local variables, function parameters, and the return address. So it's a special storage area for a process with these specific uses like for storing local variables, function parameters, and return address. So basically, we uh, the information about the function calls, okay? And uh, usually the stack is initialized with the RMC, the argument count in the, the parameter in the main function in your C program, and the argument vector. So these are the initial contents of the stack and uh, above the stack we actually have the environment variables which we will discuss later so second step allocation of the runtime stack then the third step is the creation of the heap right? so in your programs you know already that when you define variables in your c code they become data part of the program and when during the step during step one uh, the variables in your program will actually become part of the static data but sometimes you need to dynamically allocate data using the malloc uh, function and this memory allocated by malloc is done or is created in a special memory region called the heap so the, the heap is separate from the stack right and uh, this is useful because you don't know at some point in your program uh, it's possible that or when you write your program initially you don't need a specific amount of memory yet so it's wasteful if you allocate that particular amount of memory well at the beginning of your, beginning of your program but you uh, you will only need, need it once so why not use a separate memory area called the heap to allocate uh, memory to place your data temporary data for example and this is useful actually in uh, linked data structures like linked list, trees, uh, graphs. So they take advantage of this dynamic memory allocation mechanism. That's the third step, allocation of the heap. And usually this is also done lazily. If your code does not call the malloc function, usually it will, not, it will not create a heap. Okay? And even if you have a malloc call in your program initially during the creation of the process the heap will not immediately be created okay, so it's also performed lazily then the first step is that the OS does some other initialization task tasks like input output setup so I discussed this earlier so when a process is created we have uh, three open file descriptors that are present okay. so for this particular process we have std in std out and std er if our program opens a file then a new number will appear here okay 
So that's uh, what we mean the, by that. The allocation of the initial file descriptors. Then eventually the entry point called the entry point of the program will be called and the execution of the program will happen. Okay, so and this way the OS will no longer be in control. The control will now be transferred to the process and the process can begin its execution. So yeah, those are the five steps. One for loading, two for creating the runtime stack, three for creating the heap, four for the initialization of some I.O. Uh, devices like the standard input output and error and eventually transferring control to the program's entry point or the main program. Okay, so this is a graphical representation of the process of loading uh, a program for a process. So uh, let's let's say this is the CPU that elf okay, that I was uh, mentioning a while ago. After typing this and then pressing enter, we have the loader in the OS in the Linux, which uh, first actually creates this address space for the process and then load the code and static data okay. and then the next step is to allocate the runtime stack then allocate the heap then perform or in, uh, create the initial file descriptors std in out and er and then uh, jump to the execution. So that means that the RIP will be pointing to the code that will be executing now. Okay, so we uh, got an example for that. Let's try. Okay, let's try to show an example of, of this creation process. So, we can actually use uh, GDD to also load the process. So, let's say gdb.io.elf. Okay, so, so we have io.elf. And then we can type info functions, which will give us the uh, list of functions, okay? And we have the main function here. So we, let's uh, set a breakpoint there. And then we run. Then with this us, so this is the code. But okay, so let's set uh, this assembly. So this is now more readable. The syntax is more readable to you. So let's take a look at. Let's take a look at the process ID for this execution. So we can again take a look at uh, io.elf. So we have this. This is the process ID of the, pro of the process. We can take a look at the this process 7461 status. So these are the information about this particular uh, process. So notice that is io.elf. 
and we'll talk about the state later but we have here t this means that we are running this process in a debugger and we have other informations uh, here in the same the same manner that we did in the previous uh, process so you can also look at the file descriptors and the same number we have the stdl okay so let's go back to the debugger uh, Okay, uh, let's set a breakpoint here, uh, 57. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so where is that? Okay, then quant, okay, this as, okay. So what I want to show here is the creation of uh, the new file descriptor. Now, this open is a system call that opens a file, right? So if we continue the execution, We should expect a new file descriptor here. We have three here, which is actually the file descriptor. If we look at the io.c, you will notice that uh, this open call here is actually this open uh, call here in the executable. It's the source code. And we know that This is the new file descriptor which was returned, the FD. Now, if we continue executing the code and then the process will terminate, actually, we cannot find the process anymore because it's term it terminated already. But uh, before the close, I should have demonstrated the, the closing process so that the file descriptor will uh, disappear. But anyway, you have, I, I hope you got the idea already. Okay, so let's move on to the next item. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, process states. What do we mean by process states? A process can be in one of three states, uh, the basic. Right? So remember that the process is some kind of a living entity the OS has given life to a, a lifeless program and it has created a process and this process will have a life cycle like being born living and then eventually dying so when a process is alive in kicking then we say that the state of the process is running so meaning the processor actually schedules the execution of the instructions for a particular process. So instructions are being executed. Uh, another state of a process is the ready state. The ready state is the state of a process when it is ready to run, but for some reason or the OS has chosen not to run it at this given moment. So recall the discussion about policies, recall uh, the discussion about the juggler, okay? So uh, if the, if in the juggler example, if the ball is in the air, we say that that ball is uh, ready, but if the ball is being held by the hands of the juggler, we say that that ball is running. Then the third state 
is the black state we're in a process has performed some kind of operation and it's actually waiting for the completion of uh, or waiting for the result right? an example of this is when a process initiates an IO request to a disk so it becomes blocked and thus some other process can use the processor so what we mean by this is uh, a program, a, tip, a process, a typical process will usually be running on the CPU or doing I.O. So we call that the CPU I.O. cycle. So the process will be switching from executing on the CPU or requesting for I.O. and waiting for the result. And while waiting for the result, a process can 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 block the state, it can be an OCK, so that it will wait for the result of the I.O. Remember that I.O. operation is uh, more time consuming than reading from the main memory. So it will take some time. And if we let that particular process sit on the CPU doing no, uh, no not important work, just waiting, then that's a waste of the CPU. So we can remove that process, set the state of the process to block, and then run another process. Okay? And eventually, when the IO completion, is, the IO is complete, the process can become ready and eventually running. Okay? There are additional states that may be present in the OS, the, actually depending on the OS designer, I'll show you the, the process states in Linux later. Then example would be the initial state or the final or terminated state. Earlier I showed you the T, small t uh, state of the running process because it's running in the debugger. So that's one state in the Linux. Uh, process state so usually uh, process states are better visualized using uh, state transitions right? so using just the three basic states described earlier we can start with a ready process so when a process is ready then it is for consideration by the component of the operating system called the scheduler so that process will be a candidate to be executed on to execute on the CPU and if the scheduler selects that process then this the process is called scheduled and the state will change to uh, running now while running this particular process requested for an I.O. Uh, read on the disk so it will uh, initiate an I.O. so this is the action and then the state will be black because it's waiting for the uh, I.O. to complete so this is the event and this the circles represent the states and then the arrows and indi indicate the event or the events or the actions so after initiation the uh, for IO for I for IO the process will be blocked and then after some time if the IO completed then there will be a an IO completion event and then it will switch the state of the process to ready state so that on the next round of schedule scheduling decision making the process uh, can now can now be possibly selected to execute on the CPU. So, so these are called state transition diagrams or automaton. But this this uh, this is uh, used the very basic set of states that a process can be in, and the transitions from one state to another, the events that will trigger the transition from one state to another. Now let's take a look at an example here, uh, tracing process states. Okay, so 
the assumption is here is we have a single processor so this is our uh, notation so we have uh, four columns time process zero process one and some notes so we have two processes and we have a timeline here so a time one process zero is running the state is running now we, since we only have a single processor then process one will just be ready because we can only one run one program at a time so running at time one a time two running still running process zero time three process zero is still running and at time four process zero is now complete meaning it's done it's terminated because it has it has completed its task okay so we can now run the second process process one at time five six seven eight until it's done so this is how we trace the uh, execution the transition of states of a process assuming that you have a single processor and uh, also here we don't have an IO operation we only have CPU operation so these states here refer to executing on the CPU now we can also look at we can also trace the process states when we have a mixture of CPU and IO operation. I mentioned early, earlier that a process usually will transition from uh, C, we call it a CPU cycle and then IO cycle. So CPU, so it will move from one uh, from one CPU uh, from executing on the CPU or performing IO. So let's take a look at this example. Again, we assume that we have a single processor and we have two processes okay, and then we have the time. So at times one, two, and three, the process zero is running, okay? And of course, since we only have one processor, process one will just be in the ready state for times one, two, three. And at time four, process zero or at a time three actually process zero initiated an IO so what will happen is the state of process zero will become locked it's ready for an IO then the scheduler can then run process one thus changing its state to running so at times four five and six process zero is blocked because the io request is not yet completed and during these times process one is running it's busy on the cpu then at time seven the uh, the I.O. completed, the I.O. Uh, the, the IO request on process zero completed. So the state of process zero is changed to ready. Then it can actually, the scheduler can actually choose process zero to run at this point after this block, but it decided that it will continue running process one. So. That's part of the policy. We'll discuss this later. What is the advantage of not allowing process zero to interrupt the execution of process one? Why did the scheduler decided to let process one finish everything before resuming the execution of uh, process zero? So that's one of the considerations in uh, defining the for example the scheduling policies in an operating system so I hope yeah you get that concept okay so we move on now uh, no I think I miss I, I told you that I'm going to show you the examples of the states in a Linux system okay. so Now you can actually uh, so let's go back to the CPU uh, elf example. So let's run this. 
Okay. It's now running. Our next step is to can you actually use each stop program to view the processes. Okay. So you see that uh, this is the process that is running. Okay. And you can see uh, the information about the running process. Okay. So at this point, you know already that we have a process created uh, from the uh, CPU.alf program. Okay. And uh, it's eating up CPU. Should, uh, uh, should so it's uh, it's what? Okay. Oh, no, not that one. So you can experiment with this to examine the uh, uh, execution on the different process. So you will notice that there are a lot of processes running which we don't know about. Okay? So that's the idea of uh, virtualizing the CPU and HTOP shows us that we have a single processor here. Okay? So you only have one column here. Okay, so so let's take a look at the process ID okay, to illustrate the process. So this is the process ID of uh, CPU dot elf that we are currently running. So we have eight three five six. We can look at the status. Forgot the process ID number. So we can look at the eight three five six. So this is one way of looking at this code. So we have here our running. Now what are the possible states in process states in Linux? You can take a look at the ps command okay. so man ps and it will show i think there is a let's take a look at the different okay so here we have process state codes so you can access this by doing man by, write, by typing man ps. So we have d means uninterruptible sleep, usually IO. I this is a kernel thread. R, which is running, as we shown earlier. Uh, this elf process is running, the state is ready. S is interruptible sleep, waiting for an event to complete. T stopped by uh, job control signal. Uh, T, you've seen this earlier when we were debugging uh, io.elf and W, paging, not valid because it's an old st uh, state X means dead, so it should never be seen uh, these are terminated processes and then we have uh, Z, which is a zombie process terminated but but not tripped by its parent we'll talk about zombie processes later but this is one possible state of, of a process in Linux. so we have one two three four five six seven eight nine nine states so let's try uh, using some of the process api functions to manipulate the state of this currently running process so again we can we can actually we can use the kill command okay we can use the kill command to send signal to a process okay so we're going to use this command uh, there is also a system called so I'd like to differentiate this two. Uh, the first man kill will tell you the this is the user level program. 
that you can use on the command line, the kill, to directly send signal to a process. But if you're coding, writing a C code, and you would like to kill, to use the kill uh, system call, you can use this command man to then kill. So this is the uh, function signature for that uh, for that kill uh, function. So, but nonetheless, again, let's. We are. I'm interested. Uh, I'm interested in showing you how to change the state of the process. So first, let's. This is the process state. Okay. So we're going to send a kill uh, stop signal to this process. So you will notice that the display, the upper uh, tile, is the stop. The process is stopped. Right now, if we look at the status of this process. You see now that the process is stuck. Letter T is the state of the process. If you want to, uh, let's take a look at uh, each step. So this is the state of the process 8356 so it's not actually doing anything okay, at this point okay so no consumption of the cpu and no memory okay uh and it's stop now we can send the call signal for the process to resume its execution so you will notice that it is now executing again and then you see that it's now eating up CPU again. That means that the scheduler is, uh, is actually executing this uh, piece of, or this process. So you have R here. Uh, want to stop it again uh, let's stop it then let's look at the so you see the state here T okay, which means this is stop and then we can continue this and it will now be R which is running so we can look at each stop and look at the column S here, which is the process state, and you will see uh, S here, which are suspended. Right? So these are system processes. So you can explore this concept or this. Uh, realizations of the theory that you are discussing uh, in this lecture by looking by studying the Linux or the Linux operating system okay now let's take a look at the implementation of the uh, this process abstraction what are the if you are writing your own operating system what are the data structures that you have to implement okay so the or that is being used by the os so the os has some uh, key data structures the track various relevant pieces of information we have first uh, process or tasks list now process or task list basically are linked list of processes or an array of uh, processes and we have set the, the OS maintains a, li uh, a number of these lists we have a list for uh, ready processes called sometimes called the ready queue and we have a list of black process also and a list of currently uh, running processes okay. 
Uh, we're going to learn more about this list when we talk about uh, scheduling in later chapters. So that's one, one uh, data structure. Another one is the register context. Now the register context is closely associated with the hardware. Okay? So we have a different uh, register context for uh, x86-64. We have a different register context for ARM. We have a different register context for MIPS. And we have an open source uh, processor nowadays called RISC-V. So all of these have different uh, register contexts. But the main idea of register context is it will hold the values of the registers, which actually copied to a data structure in memory when a process is stopped or paused. So this is basically just saving the state of the particular process, the machine state for a process that is useful or that is unique to that particular process. And this register context will be copied back to the actual register during a context switch. So the mechanism that we mentioned earlier and uh, the idea is to resume the previously stopped or paused process. So a while ago when we uh, or in the Linux operating system um, okay. Okay. So the processor okay, as it switches from one task to another uh, the state, the context, the register context is saved. Right? Uh, let me run this uh, for so We have uh, two processes, and uh, you can see that it's a uh, process here. So we only have uh, a single CPU here, but looking at this, uh, this these two processes, okay, this one and this two, okay, they are both in the running state, okay. So as one as the processor or as, as the OS schedules one process to another, the uh, register context is actually saved and restored during a context switch. So you see the the that information here. So that's the register context and you will also see in other reference textbooks that the structure used to describe a process is often classically referred to as a process control block okay? PCB or in Linux it's sometimes called a task structure uh, in Windows, yeah, we have uh, thread execution block, I think, I forgot the name, but this is a C structure that describes the information about a particular process. So if you're writing a, an operating system kernel, you need to define a structure that characterizes the, that, that, that characterizes a process. 
So here we have an example. Uh, this is the XV6 kernel register context and process state definition. So here is the structure defining the register context. So XV6 is a 32-bit operating system used for teaching. So it stores these um, registers. So this is part of the register context. And then it also has its uh, states. Okay, so how many states? We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Six states in the XV6 operating system. So these are some of the structure, data structures that are defined in XV6. Now for the kernel proc structure or the PCB, so we have this structure definition uh, and we have uh, fields like the pointer to the address space, pointer to the memory, and okay. start of the address space. Uh, is the size of the process memory. Uh, we usually have four kilobyte pages, multiples of multi uh, four kilobyte pages. Then we have the kernel stack, okay, the bottom of kernel stack for this process. Then the state of the process, uh, the process ID, uh, the a reference to the parent process. So we talk about parent-child relationship in process creation in the next chapter. Then we have uh, other fields that are related to a process. Okay, so there. So let's take a look at uh, this this XV6 uh, thing structural operating system so first let's kill these processes so we can kill these processes uh, in each stop so uh, just click F9 and then uh, I will select SIG term to terminate the process I should begun now. Then I will also terminate this process F9. You can think of H tab as the task manager equivalent in Windows. So let me terminate this SIG term and I should have my prompt here, which is what we want. Okay. So let's uh, take a look at the uh, XV6 uh, I've shown earlier. So this operating system is part of or was developed by MIT okay, which is used in their OS class and in other universities also. So this is the source code for this particular operating system. Now, how do we test this code? So, you usually use a uh, you usually use the a make file for this, and then let's look at a particular target. So uh, we can try this target QMU to execute uh, this uh, code. So make QMU. So at this point, it is building the operating system kernel and then creating a disk image that will be used as the disk image when QMU is executed so it takes a while because we have a lot of source code so after creating the uh, disk image it will launch QMU and it will start the XV6 operating system and as you can see here I now have a dollar prompt which means that XV6 has loaded successfully 
I can try some command like help. Do we have a help command? So no help command. So let's say man. No man command. So let's type ls. So we have the ls command, right? And what other commands can we use? Uh, let's say cat readme. Cat readme. So here is the readme for the uh, xv6. Okay, so we can uh, terminate that and we're back to the path. Okay, so earlier in the slides, I showed the, the context and proc structures in xv6. So first, let's clean this. So that we remove the executable so we can look at proc.h okay to check the to look at the structures right so you see here that uh, compared to the figure in the slide for the okay, for the context the slide has a lot of uh, registers okay here but for the actual a newer version of uh, xv6 we have just a few uh, EDI, ESI, EVX, and EVP. And then when it comes to process state, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, which is the same in, in the slide. And this is the process control block or the proc structure. So we have the size of the main memory or the size of the process memory, the pointer to the page table when we go to memory management we're going to look at paging and we need to have uh, the, each process will have a reference to a page table uh, the bottom of the kernel step the state of the process etc etc which is actually the same as the one in the slide okay so let me take this uh, time also to introduce to you the ICS OS. So ICS OS is the operating system that was developed here in ICS which we use for teaching Comsei 125. So so UMU minus uh, System I three six minus F D A This is the I C S O S, so this is what you're going to play with and your project will be developed on this operating system. So in the lab, we'll have a, a more detailed discussion on how to build the uh, ICS OS and then make the disk and then uh, run the run it in QMU. So this is the uh, boot process of the ICS OS, and we now have a prompt, and then we can type ls, and then we can go to apps. And then we have a few apps here and uh, yeah it's an example uh, instructional operating system uh, developed this was an SP of one of our students and I just repackage it and make it more uh, friendly for students to play with and to modify which is actually used for teaching uh, Comsci 125 Okay, so that will be all for this chapter.